Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I am Jillian Barry, and today we have an amazing guest in store for you guys. I have wanted this guest to come on for at least six months, maybe 12. His name is Daniel McKinnon, and he has the best recipes in the raw vegan world. His recipes are absolutely incredible. The raw donuts, the raw pizza, corn dogs, just the most creative and bomb, amazing stuff. So be sure to go grab his ebook. I will link it below and let's get right into this amazing recipe. Let's hear what we have in store today and let's say hey to Daniel. Hey, how's it going? Going awesome here. It's a beautiful day. We're usually not blessed with weather this nice into the fall. So that's really awesome. Good. And yeah, you're yeah. in Calgary. I'm in Toronto and you're 18 year raw vegan, right? Yeah, it's been about 18 years now. It's been about 20 or 21 years vegan. So a few years into being vegan, I found out about raw. I basically just ate at a raw food restaurant for a week straight when I was in Vancouver and felt so good getting the, the consecutive seven days in a row being completely raw. So just based on how good I felt, that was pretty much um, how I decided to be raw. That's amazing. So, and now you make all this amazing stuff. So I'm so excited to hear what you have in store for us today. So we're going to be doing raw vegan cornbread. I have a couple different bread recipes, the white bread recipe and the corn dog or the corn bread recipe are probably my favorite. So this is what it looks like um, when it's finished. Wow. So I just made this up yesterday because we're also going to also going to be doing some sandwiches. So I wanted to have some ready made product. So that's the savory cornbread. And then this one is my sweet cotton candy cornbread. Wow. It I use it more for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and things like that. So I'm just gonna turn the dehydrator on a bit. And I'm is just wondering, really is there for people who want to get into like the raw breads, is there a dehydrator you recommend like a, a brand or anything? I recommend the Excalibur dehydrator. So I've always used an Excalibur. And I think they're what most raw foodists use. Mm -hmm. So, is the dehydrator too loud? Should no, I not at all. I don't hear it. No, it's totally fine. Sweet. Yeah. So um, I'll put the full screen on you. I'm so excited to see this recipe. And how did you get into making the breads? Is it hard to make the breads? Like the breads are so easy and so quick. Yesterday I made a white bread and I was in a rush. I wanted to get the natural sunlight. So I just didn't dehydrate it. So I just pushed it down on the dehydrator sheet, rolled it out with a rolling pin made a sandwich and because it was still soft, I folded it over and made kind of like a taco bread type thing. Wow. So, that's awesome. You're so creative, honestly, and your donuts and everything. I just look at these things on Instagram, go follow Daniel on Instagram. He's under, I think enzyme three, 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 right? Yeah. Enzyme dot three, three, three on Instagram. I actually started a TikTok too. It's raw vegan bliss on TikTok. So my TikTok's pretty fun. I think TikTok's kind of neat. Yeah. But, that's um, awesome. Yeah. So for the cornbread, what I do is normally I'll use uh, fresh corn from corn on the cob. So I just cut the corn off the cob, put it in a bag and freeze it. I'll usually use maybe three or four cobs of corn, depending on the size. But three or four cobs of corn should make about three and a half cups of corn. And if you don't have fresh corn on the cob, you can buy it frozen in the bag. I think that the frozen organic corn in the bag is actually blanched though. So it depends how picky you want to be. But yeah, that's why I try to use fresh corn on the cob. Just cut it off the cob, freeze it, and then you have it sticking around for when you need it. So what I do here is I... And thanks so much for coming on to share this. We're just so excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been I've been wanting to to do this for a long time. So very excited. And we're gonna meet up in person sometime too. So make sure you guys subscribe. I'm gonna go out west or Daniel's gonna come here and we're gonna do some recipes and some vlogs at like some raw restaurants and stuff. I think that'd be super cool. Yeah, we've got a few in town. We've got one called Monday's Plant Cafe. It's pretty good. And yeah. A lot of vegan places are, are popping up and down. So. And then there's always going on hikes and just taking picnics. Yeah, that's awesome. And you were saying you go to like Lake Louise and stuff and do picnics. It must just be so freaking like beautiful and just such good vibes doing that. 
Yeah, my ideal raw picnic would probably be at the hot springs. I've always wanted to. Well, I have done raw picnics at the hot springs, but it's not. It hasn't been for a while. But I want to take um, steep like metal bowls and put them in the hot springs so that they they can actually stay warm. I actually did that once. I went to the hot springs with my couple friends and we brought some raw food and had steel bowls and we had the bowls actually floating around in the hot springs. So we were eating out of floating bowls. Wow, that's Somebody awesome. Built a floating table. So there was a table floating around in the hot springs. It was really cool. Okay, so uh, this is about three and a half cups of corn going into the food processor. So I like to do it while it's still frozen. The reason I like to use corn while it's still frozen is because when it um, mm -hmm. when I blast it in the food processor, it'll turn to a nice dust. So it almost turns into uh, like a corn snow. So actually I'm just going to have to move this over to plug it in here. So you want to grind it quite thoroughly. You don't want any grits of corn uh, left in it. So it does take a little bit. So uh, just be patient and then keep pulsing it. And then just give it a little mix. Sometimes it'll stick to the side, so I just want to push it down. Yeah, that should that should be good. So the next step is to take a little bit of coconut flour. So this just kind of gives it a bit of a spongy consistency. So generally with coconut flour, you just want to use a small amount. You don't want to use too much because then it gets kind of dry and it'll turn into kind of a scone consistency, which is good if you're making scones, but not if you're making bread. So I use about a third of a cup coconut flour. And you'll notice I don't really measure things exact. I'm always just kind of eyeballing things. I think that's sort of how my a lot of my recipes evolve and how I've kind of been able to discover new things is basically just not following recipes and deviating from my recipes. I think it's really important to use intuition when you're doing raw recipes. With That's that. really a really great point. And I just want to say too, I feel like this bread, like breads like this without all the gluten and all the like, so many breads have just so many different ingredients, right? I feel like this is just so much more simple and you feel better after eating this, right? Compared to like a traditional bread. Oh yeah. This is pure organic, uh, local, uh, corn turned, turned into a dust. It's basically a corn dust snowball is what it is. And with this coconut flour, it just, it dehydrates and dries perfectly. And it's, uh, so it's a little bit crusty and crispy on the outside, really nice and soft and moist on the inside. When I first started doing this cornbread, when I first stumbled onto this recipe, I was just thrilled. The first time I tasted it, I was just like, oh my God, it's so good. And I think I, I was eating like just big kind of, squares of cornbread i the first time i had made it i did it in cubes and i think i just ate it with a raw ketchup i had either a raw vegan ketchup that i made or a barbecue sauce and i was just squirting barbecue sauce on it and eating it as is and it's so good you really could just eat this bread as is because it's pretty much pure corn and it's delicious <laughs> as we all know corn is delicious okay so that should be good Put this here to the side and then I put about two tablespoons of psyllium husk and psyllium husks just really nice and spongy so it gives uh gives things a lot of balance and a lot of uh texture I put it in my cakes and my donuts as well cakes donuts cookies you don't need the psyllium husk, but I do find it's a little bit bouncier and a little bit softer when you put the, the psyllium husk in. You'll notice I'm just eyeballing everything. I think that's just such an important uh, part of raw food is the intuitive side of it. 
because I find I found when I became raw, my intuition really, really increased. And I think that just it goes hand in hand. You, you being a raw vegan makes you very intuitive, and then you use that intuition to create new recipes. The that's so recipe- true. Yeah, that's like been the same with me. And I'm just wondering, like, before you were raw, were you into cooking? Were you like a chef? Or is this like a whole new thing that came from you becoming raw vegan? Yeah. Um, no, not at all. I was not into into food at all. Basic, that basically came about when I became vegan. So before I was vegan, I became vegan when I was probably just turning 20, between somewhere between 19 and 21 years old, I became vegan. And um, before before I became vegan, I was just eating kind of like standard American diet, junk food. I didn't really draw the connection between food and how I felt. But as soon as I became vegan, I started learning recipes. It was really my friends who kind of got me into, into veganism. I've always kind of been an animal person and an animal rights type person. Even before be- becoming vegan, I was against uh-huh. certain things like the rodeo and um, you know, factory farming and things like that. But um, I just really wasn't uh, introduced to, v- to veganism. I think I had tried to go vegetarian once when I was a teenager and probably last maybe a week because I wasn't really making my own meals and um, I was still eating the cheese and the eggs. So when you go vegetarian, I don't think you feel quite as good as you do when you when you become vegan. And how I got introduced to veganism was basically my friends. And it was through um, through the music scene. And a lot of the music that I listened to was had a very pro vegan message. A lot of it was uh, basically uh, had to do with environmentalism. I used to listen to a lot of grindcore and death metal and Coincidentally, a lot of those bands are vegan, which is kind of surprising. So, but yeah, basically my friends kind of got me interested in veganism and we started going out to eat at uh, these little Buddhist vegan restaurants. And I just kind of fell in love with the whole vibe. You know, after eating at a few vegan restaurants, I just really, really kind of fell in love with it. and Just really wanted to be vegan. So at one point, one certain day, I just decided, heck, I'm vegan, or I'm going to be vegan. And, it, you know, and then from that day forward, I stopped eating all animal products. Wow. And it's kind of funny, because when I made the decision, I was completely flooded with all of these positive emotions. And it was, it was a feeling that in my body that I, that I had never felt before. And the, the strange thing about it is, is that I wasn't actually eating a meal. There was no food in me that made me feel that good. It was just the decision. It's kind of like you do something good. You know, you go and you do a good service for somebody and then you get that good feeling that comes along with it. That's exactly how I felt when I, uh, when I became vegan. Wow, that's so interesting. What a like beautiful thing, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really awesome. And from that moment forward, I just never looked back. Um, my group of friends were really, really important. It's a very important uh, part of me becoming vegan because they were the ones who took me under their wing and taught me how to be vegan. So like I said, before I became vegan, I was a terrible cook, didn't know what I was doing. I was eating junk food and just whatever I could. And my friends, basically, they taught me how to make how to cook, how to make all these different dishes. And this was all back back when we were all eating cooked food. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I discovered raw food. And then when I discovered raw food, it was just um, a whole new level of feeling good. And yeah, it was actually just an, an amazing, amazing experience. Okay, so we're going to do two tablespoons of chia seed in the bottom of a of a blender. I just use a small little hand blender. I don't have a Vitamix or anything. I've never really used a Vitamix. They are nice blenders, but you don't need a Vitamix to be a raw vegan. This is what I use actually. It's just a little star fruit blender. And then I can travel around with it, take it around. I took this to Costa Rica with me this winter. It's actually been to three different countries with me. So and uh, I like to mill my own chia because when you buy it in a package, sometimes there's little seeds left in it 
they don't really do a good job of milling it. I like it to be milled a little more thoroughly. So, and again, that's, that's a little too much. So if people don't want to mill the chia seed themselves, so then they would buy the ground chia seed, right? You can buy the ground chia seed. It's just going to leave whole seeds in your bread. So if you don't want the look of the whole seed in there, you can mill it yourself. But it really, it, act, it, it acts the same in the recipe. It doesn't really make any difference. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and just blast this with the dry blender plate here. Pull it in there. Okay, so. Then I'm going to put about a quarter cup of water. See, that's a little too much, actually. So I'm probably not going to use all of this chia egg. I call it a chia egg because I'm basically making an egg out of chia dust. So I'll put the water in here. Yeah. Probably enough. And then... Give it a little mix because it'll it'll stick to the bottom and it gets kind of annoying so give it a little stir and then i'd like to give it a quick little blend after that just to smooth it all out they might put a little more water in here but it's basically two two tablespoons and a quarter cup of water makes the chia egg and then that'll go perfectly into the three and a half cups of um corn there so just, and that should be good. That just goes into the, the blender or the food processor rather. And sometimes I add the chia egg bit by bit just because I don't know because I'm eyeballing things, sometimes I put a little more, you know, coconut flour in or a little bit less corn and uh, it'll, it'll act differently depending on my ratios. So and that's another thing I do with raw food is a lot of the time I'm just not using a recipe, but I add things bit by bit and then you get a feel for, for how it should be and for how you want it. And I find that helps with the creative process as far as inventing new things, because you're using your intuition. And when your intuition opens up, basically these uh, you just get flooded with ideas. So that's a big, that's an important part of making raw food for me. It's kind of funny. Most of my recipe ideas come to me while I'm walking in nature, which is kind of strange. But it also kind of makes sense because that's when you're most relaxed. That's when you're at peace. And, um, you know, that's just when I'm able to, to come up with these things. So it's usually not when I'm in the kitchen. I'm usually not overthinking recipes when I come up with good ones. Okay, so I got a hydrator sheet here. So I'm only going to put half of this down because I'm going to be making kind of two styles. I'm going to make the savory bread for the barbecue pulled pork jackfruit thing. And then I'm going to save some of it. And then I'm going to throw some beetroot powder, which I think is in the other room. And then I'm going to make a, I'm going to spike the other batch of bread with beetroot powder. And it's going to make that two tone colorful bread that I like to use for the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So Half of this will go down on a dehydrator tray. It doesn't really have to be perfect because I have some ready-made ones to, to pull out and put the sandwiches together, together with. So that should be good. And then I just push it down with my hands. So it's still kind of frozen when I'm pushing it down, 
and then and I find it it forms and works a lot better while I'm pushing it down if it's frozen a little bit. So if you let it thaw out while you're trying to form it, it can just kind of turn into a bit of a a bit of a like a corn smoothie. <laughs> so it's not as important to push it down while it's frozen for the bread. But I have a corn dog recipe that I do using this bread. And you definitely want to, when you're putting the cornbread on a corn dog or something, you want to do it while it's frozen because it's like working with a snowball compared to, you know, working with a batter. So I just find it, uh, it forms around the corn dog a lot easier. And um, as soon as I push this bread down, I'll quickly show you guys what the corn dogs look like. The corn dogs are probably my favorite recipe, to be honest. Yeah, those corn dogs, I haven't tried them. They look insane on your instagram page they taste just like corn dogs just like you remember from when you're a kid and i i actually really 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 like corn dogs that's awesome but it was it was basically the flavor of this bread and the taste of this bread that inspired me to make the corn dog recipe because when i tried this bread i was just like oh my god that tastes like corn dogs it tastes so good and wow. i was like damn it, I'm just going to make a corn dog, make a veggie dog. So I was already doing, making hot dogs. And I'd always make them with Irish moss and beets. And back then I was using sprouted sunflower seeds to make the, the veggie dog. Now I don't really use sunflower seeds. I've basically kind of eliminated all of the, the nuts and seeds from my diet. Chia seeds I use, but I think a lot of people will agree that chia seeds don't really react the same as, you know, say sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds. And I'm not against the use of all nuts and seeds. I think that if you're eating a balanced diet and you're relatively low fat and eating a lot of fruit and vegetables, you know, you can get away with eating some cashews or some soaked sunflower seeds. But I think in certain cases, for people who are raw vegan, for health reasons and really healing some chronic illnesses, it is, in my opinion, very important to be extremely low fat, very high fruit, and um, and avoid those nuts and seeds. And lately, I basically don't have any nuts and seeds in my diet. So my first ebook does have a little bit, some higher fat recipes, and some of the kind of more gourmet fancy, fancy stuff. But my second two ebooks are pretty much all nut and seed free and very low fat. The only uh, fatty ingredient that I use is this coconut cream. I don't have any on hand, but um, coconut cream is basically just ground coconut butter. So it's the whole coconut ground into a butter. So it's basically like peanut butter, but made with the coconut. So I don't mind using that. So. That's what it'll look like when you push it out. And it's just, it's just that easy. You basically make your corn snowball and then you push it down on a dehydrator sheet. You can kind of go as thick or as thin as you want. For sandwiches, I like to go about that thick. Sometimes I'll make it really thick. And like I said, just cut it into cubes, put ketchup or barbecue sauce and gobble it back because it's honestly that good. And so I'm just going to slide this into the dehydrator. And I'm quickly going to show you guys here. I'll put the tripod back up so you can actually see me, not just my hands. So here are the corn dogs. I just like to have stuff like this kind of kicking around in the, in the fridge. So I'll go and make up a bunch of raw foods, like say on Monday and Tuesday, I'll just go hard. I'll make breads, corn breads, uh, corn dogs, veg like veggie meats, dehydrated lion's mane is a big thing that I'm doing lately. And it's kind of funny. I was uh, watching your YouTube with uh, Aris or Iris. Is that, I'm bad at pronouncing the name. With, with Aris Latham? Aris, yeah. Yeah. And he was kind of saying he's, kind of a little bit on the fence with the mushrooms or he's saying like no mushrooms I'm kind of like I'm kind of on the fence with it I didn't eat mushrooms for probably eight years 
because I was like, oh, it's a fungus. Maybe we shouldn't be eating it. Lately, I've been doing uh, medicinal mushrooms like reishi, chaga, lion's mane. So yeah, I've been making these uh, lion's mane barbecue little cutlets. They're really good. But yeah, that's just basically my thing. I like to have things kicking around. So there's going to be raw breads in my freezer. There's corn dogs sitting in the fridge. So if I get home and I'm hungry, I can just, you know, grab a corn dog and eat it or whatever. And it's not like I'm stressed, but there is a little bit of planning that goes into that. And that just comes with time and practice. When you first get into raw food, you're going to, you know, you're going to be learning the recipes. Like with me, I started learning raw food recipes slowly. I went in like, basically, I had that week of eating raw at the restaurant, realized how good I felt. All of my friends agreed. We were like, yeah, like we feel good. This is awesome. This is really cool. And we knew we weren't master raw chefs right off the bat. So we just, what we did is we all got together as a group and we did one recipe a week, you know, one of like, one of us would go research a recipe, we'd learn it, and then we'd all meet up and we'd do that recipe, teach it to the to everybody else. And that kept going for about a year or two. And then at around the two year mark, we were basically all so good, such good raw chefs that we started going raw and we just kind of stopped eating the cooked food. But I do remember that high raw period before I went completely raw being it, that, that was really fun I think there was that was kind of like a magical kind of like time in in my raw food adventure and I think it was just because I was learning the raw foods I was starting to feel the benefits and feeling better and better the more raw food I included in my in my diet but I could still kind of go to Chinatown and eat like the vegan Chinese food which is amazing so I'm a big fan of high raw as well although I am like 100% raw just because it feels so good and I'm completely thoroughly addicted to raw food at this point so even like even the little bits of cooked food I'm kind of like yeah I don't feel as good after that so I just don't do it anyway yeah, me I'll too I feel so much better like I feel so good on raw too yeah I know it's just you eat the raw and then you feel you eat the cooked food and you feel this drop and you're just kind of like okay I'm still vegan so you know thankful for that but it's just that drop I can't deny it so it's just I just do raw all the time and I'm pretty strict with it even when I'm traveling like especially when I'm traveling I do raw like full raw and I make a strong point of it and not only is it good and it always works out but that's when I figure out new things so if I'm in a new city or in, in a new country and there's like weird ingredients or especially very limited in ingredients, I'll come up with a new recipe and I'll always end up making something just amazing. And it, I'm just like, wow, I thought I wasn't going to have raw food. You know, for instance, if I go to a small town and there's nothing around, there's always going to be something. And a lot of the time it's something growing out of the earth. And I got really into just kind of like picking weeds and making things out of what I had. I think I'd be raw no matter what, you know, there's always raw food around there's always something you can make something out of so anyway i'll get back to this um this cornbread recipe so basically with the with the rest of this i'm going to pretty much do the same thing except i'm going to spike here i'll turn this point this down again should be good So I'm just going to take half of it, leave half of it out, and blend the rest of it up with a little bit of beetroot powder. And you can use um, you can use just a, a little fingerful of grated beet too, and put that in. That turns it pink. I just use beetroot powder now because I have access to it at Community Natural Foods, and it's really cheap in bulk. When I was living in Banff. We didn't have, I didn't have access to beetroot powder. So I would just take a little bit of grated beet, put that in there and, and blend it up. And sometimes I'll use, where is it? Sometimes I'll hit it with a little bit of E3 Live. So this is blue magic. It's basically blue spirulina from Lake Klamath, Oregon. And I just, I really like to use this in my icings, cakes, desserts. 
it gives you that brilliant vibrant electric blue and it looks really cool so i'm just gonna go grab the beetroot powder unless it yeah here it is and i'm sure you could put cinnamon you could put vanilla in here vanilla would be really good actually you know what i'm gonna put a little bit of vanilla in here just, just because just because right Life's too short to do the same recipe exactly the same every single time, I think anyways. So you just wanna, I think you probably want about a half a teaspoon in there, but you'll know, like you basically just pulse it up. If it's not pink enough, put a little bit more in. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's gonna be amazing either way. And so I'm gonna buzz that. And yeah, see, probably want a little bit more. So this colorful one's gonna be for the peanut butter and jam sandwiches. So instead of using nut butter, I'm gonna use coconut cream. And I do technically have some sprouted Brazil nuts kicking around. I could make a sprouted Brazil nut butter in here, but I've just been so nut free lately that I'm just kind of like, nah, let's just use coconut cream instead. I'll actually show you the coconut cream that I use. Yeah. So they also call it coconut manna. And then there is a little bit of coconut oil that separates to the top. I just skim that coconut oil right off. Just cut the fat right out. There's a certain amount of fat that naturally exists in, in coconut, but this wouldn't have any more fat than say a fresh young Thai coconut. It's just the dehydrated uh, ground solids. So I think it's it's a lot better than you know eating a bunch of nuts and seeds. So I'm just gonna quickly skim this fat off and turf it. There go. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna free up a tray here. There we go, there's one. So what I do is I just kind of place the, the corn down in little clumps. So I usually make four different piles. Push it together like that. Well, maybe eight different piles. Because the idea is just to kind of make it two-toned and give it that, that kind of nice color and that nice aesthetic. So bit there, a little bit here, and then you're gonna want just want to space it out. It looks really cool with the blue magic in there too. And the cool thing about blue magic spirulina is that not only does it look cool, but the blue spirulina is incredibly nutritious. It's said to be one of the most nutritious foods on the planet. I think I could honestly probably pick out about 10 or 15 different foods and be like, this is one of the most nutrition, you know, nutritious foods on the planet. Another one being Irish moss. Irish moss is straight up one of my favorite food ingredients. It's just, um, it's amazing on your digestion. It is so good for your skin. When I eat Irish moss the next day, like especially if I haven't had Irish moss in a while, I'll wake up and my skin just feels 10 times as thick. It actually kind of freaked me out the first time I ate Irish moss. So I woke up and I kept touching my face. I was just like, what the heck is with my skin? Why is my skin so soft? It's that's almost crazy. I've That's one thing I've never tried Irish moss. I have to try it. I think do people, some people put it in their smoothies. It's really good in, in smoothies. You just make a little, you make a little gel with it. And, um, I put it in most of my veggie meats, like my, those corn dogs I showed you guys, those contain Irish moss. I also call them like my Irish moss dogs, just because it's kind of a cool name and it kind of moss dog kind of rhymes with hot dog. And, you know, then you're getting all the benefits of the Irish moss in your, in your hot dog. <laughs> but the thing with Irish moss is Irish moss has almost all of the minerals that you need to sustain human life. So I think we need something like 102 or 109 minerals 
some people say 102, some people say 107, some people say 109 minerals, but um, Irish hot moss has 92 of those minerals. And um, it also, it, it's really high in sulfur, which is really important for the human body. And a lot of foods don't contain a lot of sulfur. You know, like durian contains sulfur, I believe, but not too many other foods contain it. And it's something that you really want. Apparently, it's really good for mood as well. So Irish moss, definitely, if you ingest Irish moss and you eat it, like say you were to make a smoothie and put Irish moss gel, probably within a few hours, you'll notice a huge mood boost. It's, it's just really, really good for your state of mind and for your mood. It's really, really good on the digestive tract like, and noticeably good on the digestive tract. You can feel it in your stomach right away. You just feel good. It's kind of interesting because a bunch of my friends that I was living with when I lived in Nelson, a little town called Nelson in British Columbia, they were all Rastafarians from Jamaica. And as soon as I pulled my bag of Irish moss out to start making some desserts, they just lost it. They went berserk. They were so stoked that I had Irish moss. They're like, oh man, he's got the moss. Like, and they were they all started telling me stories about how their mom used to make Irish moss for them, like in times of famine, like basically when they didn't have much food in the house. So it's used as a real kind of like staple in poverty times. And that's actually how it got its name because the the Jamaicans sent it to Ireland during the potato famine when people were starving to death because they knew you could live off of it for so long. So, and they all agree, and I agree with them, that when you fast on Irish moss, say you were to only ingest Irish moss for about three days, you get kind of a spiritual high from the Irish moss. And it feels great, but we all agreed on that. And they all shared stories about how, you know, when they were growing up in Jamaica, when they didn't have food around, they'd, their mom would cook up the Irish moss you know, and they just feel so good, so nourished. And we all talked about how, how good it makes your skin feel. And it's just a really, really amazing food. So if I'd have to say, pick a favorite food, I'd almost say it's Irish moss. And I guess Irish moss and bladder act seaweed together have the full spectrum of nutrients and minerals that you, and you could completely live off of that. Okay, so that's what it'll look like. And then just pop it into the dehydrator here. And so when you're dehydrating this, I don't really time it. I think in my book, I have a specific dehydration time. But really, it's, it dehydrates really quickly. So it's basically just a few hours on each side, depending on how hot your dehydrator goes. See, my dehydrator is broken right now because I took it to Mexico, Costa Rica, and Panama this winter. And I had it in my carry-on. And I was like running around everywhere, like all over South America. So my suitcase took a couple heavy drops. So now my food process, uh, my food dehydrator only goes, I think I can only put it on 95. So, and 95 is a good setting for dehydrating. You know, for sure, it's like the enzymes are intact because that's a very low dehydration time. But basically I'd say just, Put it in for a couple hours on each side and just check it and you can see whether it's crusty and dry on the top as soon as it gets crusty and dry on the top just flip it and let it get crusty and dry on the other side and then it'll be perfect and the coconut flour inside the the cornbread it's very uh, absorbent so it wicks moisture from the inside of the bread to the outside of the bread and it works really well so so then you dehydrate that and then I'll move on to the the jackfruit recipe here. So this is a really cool recipe. So a lot of people make uh, cold pork jackfruit from a can and I'm not really down with canned foods. I think the canned jackfruit, jackfruit is also cooked. I could be wrong. But what I'm using here, this is, I got this at the Asian market. You can get this at basically any Asian market. This is green, frozen, unripe jackfruit. So what you do is you thaw this out 
and then you squeeze all of the water out of it. And that's your first step. And I'll show you here in a second. Just that in the freezer. So I saved a little bit of it here just so I can demonstrate how I take it out of the, how I squeeze the water out. So this is what it looks like. And it's a really cool looking substance when it's uh, fresh and raw like this. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna take it and you're gonna squeeze the water out of it. You wanna squeeze it quite thoroughly. So squeeze every little bit of water out of it. I guess it's white like that because it's not ripe, right? Like the usual yellow? Yeah, it's not right. Yeah, it's usually yellow and beautiful. And so that's not actually the fruit. That's like the weird latexy part that surrounds the fruit. The fruit in here, you'll see it. It's just little buttons. But it's really interesting. I, I saw on Instagram a couple of days ago, they were taking little like mini, like baby unripe jackfruits and pulling it right off the tree dipping it in like a tamarind sauce and just eating it like french fries and that kind of really blew my mind because they say don't eat unripened fruit because it's not very digestible and not very good for you yeah so we're gonna marinate this there's a few different ways you can marinate it but what i've been doing lately is i've been marinating it in unpasteurized pickle juice because i've been making pickles like crazy the past couple of weeks what I was originally doing was uh, just letting it sit in lemon juice or any kind of unpasteurized vinegar for one to two days. And the longer you let this, this stuff sit in the lemon juice or vinegar, the softer it'll become. So you marinate it for a couple of days and it becomes nice and soft. It's basically bringing it to the same texture that it would be if you, if you cooked it. So... Now I have a few different recipes with this. I also make, it also makes like a nice kind of chicken consistency. So I made a, I made a chicken noodle soup and used the jackfruit for the chicken noodle soup. And it was, ama it was absolutely amazing. There's this flower that I picked up from the superfood store in town. It's called the Light Cellar Superfoods. Amazing store. My friend Malcolm actually started the store out of his basement about 15 16 years ago and he was wow. just selling bags of irish moss out of his cellar wow and that's cool and then he got into a store front and named it the light cellar but um i'll just show you guys quickly so this is the this is the chicken that i made and it is so nice but yeah, what I was saying is I picked up this bag of um, helichrysum flowers and helichrysum, you can make helichrysum tea and it tastes and smells exactly like chicken noodle soup. So I had made a cup for my friend Charlotte and she was like, oh my God, this tea tastes exactly like uh, chicken noodle soup. So I started flavoring this with the helichrysum and just certain spices and it made a really beautiful chicken noodle soup. That's just kind of an idea of how you, just, you stumble onto ideas, right? And you get creative and you're just like, oh, this tastes like this, this smells like this, this would go good with this, this would go good with that. So I like to give this a rough chop once it's kind of, once you've squeezed that moisture out of it. So you just put that in like that. And then just find either your, your unpasteurized vinegar or your pickle juice. Here's some pickled pickled uh, onions. So there's pickled squash in this jar, which was really good. Squash makes really good pickles. I found that out last week. So I'm just gonna pour like whatever 
try and try and cover the try and cover the jackfruit in liquid. You don't have to completely cover it. It's going to soak up the liquid probably anyways. And then marinate that for a day or two. The longer you marinate it, the better. Another thing you can do is you can just, um, once you make your barbecue sauce, you can actually just marinate it in barbecue sauce and leave that sit for a couple days. But I've just been doing this because it makes it extra soft. And um, then I can just grab it out of the fridge, throw my barbecue sauce in there and be good to go. So that goes marinades for a couple of days. And then... Well, I just want to say too, I appreciate all the work you've taken to show us how to make this. Oh yeah. I do this all the time. Like this is just like a regular day for me. Like I love making raw food so much that I just always do it. And I guess like for some people, it does look like a lot of work and it is really daunting. And for me, because I love doing it so much, it's like, I don't have to make raw food. I get to make raw food. So, you know, if I could, I'd just be making raw food all the time and just be constantly making new recipes. So here's some that I've had uh, marinating for a couple days here. Well, maybe one day, but it's nice and soft. So this is perfect texture and consistency. You could just eat this right now at it as is, and it'd be amazing. So for this one, I used um, the, the pickle juice from pickled beets that my friend made. So it's kind of cool too, because when you use different flavored pickle brines, you're, it's going to come out a different flavor. And pickle juice is delicious. So it, it always, always tastes good. So I'm going to drain the excess um, pickle juice off here. I'm going to put this probably into a cup or something. So my next ebook that I'm coming out with, I'm probably going to have a lot of different pickle recipes because that's what I've been doing. And another thing I've been doing lately is water kefir. It's my friend Jenny, who I live with. She's just really into kefir culture and making all these different ferments. She makes soda, like all these different raw vegan sodas. So I've been getting into making raw vegan soda pop and it's so, it's so good. And it's just so balling to be able to pour, you know, um, to pour a cup of soda pop, you know, next to your raw vegan meal and drink that, you know, sparkly carbonated pop. It's, it's really good. Okay. So I'm just going to rinse this out really quick here. Okay. And for the barbecue sauce, we're going to do, so that's about a quarter cup of sun-dried tomatoes. These are really, really beautiful sun-dried tomatoes. So this is from the garden back in the backyard. So that's maybe a quarter cup. And I'm just going to keep some because I want some of these seeds because this is a really, really good tomato variety. There we go. So I'm going to put two teaspoons of chili flakes in there. You can use dried uh, red pepper if you don't like it to be spicy, but I, I really like spicy. So I'm going to do that. Gives it a really nice color as well. And I have some date kicking around somewhere. Here we are. So that's maybe, maybe a quarter cup of dates, maybe a little bit less. I'm just going to squish it up here so it's easier on the blender. Oh, there's a pit too. Make sure there's no pits in there. There's that. So I'm going to use some coconut syrup. So this is coconut flour nectar. Normally I use yacon syrup because yacon syrup tastes a lot like molasses. It tastes almost identical to molasses. And you really want that molasses flavor in your barbecue sauce. That's really what gives it that barbecue sauce flavor. Um, so I'm just going to go maybe one, two tablespoons. 
And the coconut syrup, this, this has a bit of a molasses flavor as well. So it's kind of second best to Yukon. I just, um, I didn't have time to run across the town, uh, across town to go to the light cellar and get it, but this stuff works really good too. So you want about two teaspoon, two tablespoons of um, smoked paprika. So I'm gonna put all of that in there. Probably not quite two tablespoons, but it'll probably still be good. <laughs> Normally I put a little, So I'm gonna put half of a clove of Russian red garlic. So this is quite a bit stronger than, than most garlic. So if you're putting half a clove of Russian red, you could even go put a full clove of, um, of regular garlic in. And I guess just depending on how much you like garlic, right? If you're not super, super keen on lots of garlic, maybe go less, maybe go a quarter clove, but... Um, I'm gonna go for a half a clove here. And then, so we're gonna put about a quarter cup of unpasteurized vinegar of your choice. I'm using a homemade vine grape vinegar or it's actually a raisin vinegar with um, made with kefir, with water kefir. But um, you can use apple cider vinegar, any kind of unpasteurized vinegar. So, you put a quarter cup there. Oh, that smells so good. I'll have all the homemade vinegars and everything in my next ebook too. So, okay, let's see if I'm forgetting anything. Some clove. Not too much clove, but maybe, I don't know, like a, an eighth of a teaspoon and a half to a, to a quarter teaspoon. Okay, a quarter te teaspoon of clove. You don't want to put too much clove in because clove is really strong. And then you just want to top it off with water, just about a little bit above the, the, the dry ingredients. So maybe basically to about there, just so it, just enough water so that it blends properly. Lately, I've been putting fermented blueberries in my barbecue sauce too. It's really good. The fermented blueberry water kefir blueberry sauce is going to be in in the next book as well. So where did my lid go or my blender? Here we go. Okay, and then you just give it a blend. So you want it to get pretty smooth. It should be good. Normally I just I'll have to say like that looks absolutely freaking delicious, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's, I love barbecue sauce. This is more of a barbecue hot sauce. Like I really, really like hot sauce. So <laughs> that's really good. Really, really good. So you don't have to, I go tend to go a lot lower on the salt these days, but I'm going to sprinkle it with a little bit of sea salt because sea salt is an important ingredient in barbecue sauce. But I mean, if you don't want the sea salt, the vinegar, it, it's great. You know, like it, it, it still tastes good without the sea salt. And I'm still going to go lower on the sea salt. And then this is a little bit of a, of, of a trick that I figured out a couple months ago. But this E3 Live, so this blue algae, if you put a little bit of the blue in there, it'll give it a really nice burgundy kind of Reuben color. So you don't want to put too much uh, E3 Live in it. And I'd go bit by bit with the, with the E3 Live. You don't need it, but this is purely just for aesthetics. 
And, and it, do, it doesn't the, really affect the flavor much, right? No, no, not at all. It just, it, it, it makes it kind of burgundy, gives it like a burgundy purple kind of barbecue sauce color, which is really cool. I'll probably end up having to put more in here. And then keep in mind, I did use bright orange sun-dried tomatoes. Normally I'll use a red tomato. So that could mm -hmm. also kind of affect the color. Now yeah, maybe I'll put a little bit more in here. I think it looks good still, even that color. I mean, I would love to freaking try that right now. It looks so good. And I love spicy too. Yeah, I'm a fiend for spicy food. Oh, that might be too much. So like, what are some different things raw vegans could use this barbecue sauce with? I basically put it on everything. Like I made a salad the other night and I put, I based the dressing was barbecue sauce and leftover cranberry sauce from Thanksgiving. And it was actually really, really good. You can put it on burgers. You can put it on, um, like I do mm -hmm. lots of, raw vegan barbecue stuff because it was around the time that I became vegan my friends were just always inviting me to barbecues so I'd be sitting at the barbecue and I'd be like eating nothing or eating salad and my friend Johnny had just purchased a cold smoker so he was smoking everything like he was going hard on barbecue everything but of course, like conventional barbecue stuff, he was mostly making briskets and he was, he was making his own barbecue sauces. So he was smoking his own peppers. And I was like, well, I'm just going to get a bunch of peppers and put them in Johnny's cold smoker and smoke my own peppers. So I started making my own barbecue sauces. And that was around the time that I started making Irish moss hot dogs and smokies. And so I was smoking those in his cold smoker too. And it was like, it was basically a way to connect with my friends who aren't vegan and just hang out and, and do, do raw vegan barbecue stuff. So I kind of got really into it for a while. And then coincidentally, my friend Johnny, who was this big barbecue guy who had purchased the cold smoker, went vegan for a couple of years after I started making raw, like the raw barbecue stuff at his backyard parties. He only lasted a couple of years on vegan, like not everybody does, but I did have him going vegan for a couple of years and I'm quite proud of that. And he was doing really well mm -hmm. on vegan, but um, I think just pressure, it, a lot of his friends were kind of teasing him and whatnot. So he caved, but yeah, anyway, yeah. What else do I do with the barbecue sauce? Like I put it on the cornbread and just dip it like ketchup and eat it. Okay, that should be pretty good. One thing I am gonna do though. Oh yeah, see, I think that color is even a little bit deeper and a little bit better. I'm gonna give this jackfruit a little bit more of a rough chop here. Cause it's still kind of in chunks, right? And just look at that, look at how that pulls apart just like, um, just like pulled pork or whatever. It's actually so good. I've never actually had pulled pork to be completely honest. So yeah, I'm just gonna quickly give this a rough chop. And yeah, like one of the things that's really kept me raw for a long time <clears throat> is the fact that it's actually so fun to make the recipes. And one thing that I like about raw food is that it's it's a pretty new way of eating. Like I think that raw food is very ancient. I think that humanity originally didn't cook its food. And there's a lot of archeological evidence that can back that up. And, but in recent years, it, as it's resurfaced, it's really quite new. And the idea of, um, you know, making, raw food that kind of has that cooked look to it it's pretty new so there's a lot of things that haven't been tried in raw food like there's just so many things that haven't been tried so for me the fun part is really looking at um, conventional foods that i liked and loved as a child and then just figuring out how i can do them raw so a lot of my influence 
for raw foods didn't really come from inside the raw the raw food community most of my inspiration for everything I make it actually comes from outside of the raw community yeah I think that's really cool I think like even I think you make shepherd's pie even and stuff like that right I love shepherd's pie so shepherd's pie is the very first raw vegan recipe that I ever made wow and I think that's part of the, another part of the reason that I stayed raw and got so into it is because it was so good. So, so good. And my style of shepherd's pie, a lot of people just make the one layer, but I've all like the way my mom makes it. There's a big layer of mashed potatoes on the bottom and like a big layer of like really hearty, like she used ground beef when I, when I was growing up, but, um, she used a really big, nice, hearty layer of ground beef with corn and carrots and vegetables in it. And then another big layer of mashed potato. So mine's double layer. So my uh, shepherd's pies are super thick and super humongous. But everybody loves the, the shepherd's pie. And I just use um, mashed, ca mashed cauliflower, which I think is what most people make their, their shepherd's pie out of. Yeah, that's a good idea making me want to make shepherd's pie now all of a sudden yeah you're making me want to eat shepherd's pie i'm on a juice cleanse right now and i'm like oh all these foods i have to try as soon as i'm done oh no <laughs> <laughs> it's okay yeah. i feel so good though i can wait it's fine no juice cleansing is awesome like i mean i think that juice cleansing it, it it totally has its place and especially when it comes to healing and people who are uh healing of chronic illnesses Juice cleansing is just such a fast and effective way to um, heal the body. Yeah, uh, I agree. And I just like, I feel like it's so great for modern times. You know what I mean? I just feel like the juicer is like the best invention ever because you can still heal and like at the same time have so much energy from the calories of the juice versus water fasting. I haven't done water fasting, so I don't like to speak on things I haven't done, but I feel like with water fasting, yeah. in most cases, people are resting and like not as energized, right? From what I think then That's compared to the juicing weird. yeah definitely like i've done the master cleanse which is just lemon juice maple syrup and cayenne pepper and i did that for almost three weeks and i felt ama like amazing that's the only real like juice fast type fasting cleanse that i've ever done but i mean i got such a such a spiritual high off of it and just breaking the whole like association with needing food kind of like breaking free of that I think was the the real cool part the real neat part of that that cleanse so oh yeah that's a really nice burgundy color so yeah now it's really nice Okay, and then you just put that in there and mix it around. Try not to get it all over the place here. But yeah, it's funny. I do have all these ideas for different things I want to make raw, but it kind of drives me nuts because I want to make them all at the same time and all in the same day. And then I realize, oh, I could never, I could never eat all this stuff. Yeah. So lately, I've been having to like call friends over and just brainstorm for people to to go feed like those corn <laughs> dogs in, in the fridge like they're just sitting there and I've already had so many corn dogs so I messaged my friend Carrie up and I was like you got to meet me at the skate park so we can eat some corn dogs because otherwise stuff's gonna start going bad that's awesome you lucky friends and that that barbecue sauce seriously <laughs> it looks so freaking good it, I love bar I just love barbecue sauce and you can get really creative with barbecue sauce. There's, um, you know, so many different styles that you can make. Like I say, the the blueberry barbecue sauce is very popular these days. And, um, and then I, I did the fermented blueberry barbecue sauce. So I made a blueberry soda pop. So I got a bunch of blueberries from work. I'm working for a farmer right now, and a local organic farmer. So she had a bunch of blueberries that just needed to be taken and I took a case of them. So I've been making blueberry soda pop, blueberry barbecue sauce. So doesn't that just look so much like a, like a pulled pork, right? And it's cool because it's not from a can. 
fresh frozen, really, really cool. The the fresh frozen pulled jackfruit is a it's a total game changer. Total game changer. So I'm gonna get I'm just gonna rinse this cutting board off really quick. And we'll just dry it off a bit here. So we'll grab some of the cornbread. Whatever it is. <laughs> Maybe in a fridge. Okay, here it is. Just about lost the cornbread there. So, give it a slice. And should actually have some greens to put on here. Plate, put that on there. So I'll just bring you guys outside into the backyard really quickly and I'll pick some greens here. Give you a quick little garden tour. A quick garden tour. I just realized I don't really have any other greens in the house other than what we're growing in the backyard. Beautiful out here. Can you believe this is October in Canada? Like we've still got tomatoes popping off here. Nice little, those black tomatoes are my favorite. So I'm thinking just Swiss chard. I'm just gonna grab a few leaves here. I don't think I need too much. I'll pick a few beet greens too, just for just for variety. I like things that are very rich in iron. And you, you look at the, the the red veins there, you can just see how iron rich they are. Meh, maybe one more, that'll be good. I got to say, this is really coming together and looking really, really good. These are going to be really good sandwiches. See, I'm not going to eat them right away because it's too eat, too early for me to eat pulled pork. Normally, I'll just do, uh, like, I've been starting my day with grapes. Grapes are amazing. Like, grapes are so cleansing and healing. Uh, really good for the kidney and liver and really good for moving the lymphatic system. I just think it's so important to to start the day with something like grapes and or like a citrus fruit and just get as much calories in on fruit as as I can. And then I'll move on to something a little more starchy like bananas, a little bit more starchy of a fruit. And then I've been moving on to durian. I've been basically going buck wild on the durian lately. It's on sale right now at the Asian market, so so I've been taking advantage of that. And then, so I was told to eat this garden tomato, so we'll use this one here. Maybe I'll grab a red one as well. So nice having tomatoes from the garden, seriously. I like to use ceramic knives because apparently it doesn't oxidize your and wilt your greens as bad. And they also say that it keeps the electrical aura in something like a tomato or carrot when you cut it. There's actually scientific evidence of this through Kirlian photography, which photographs the electrical aura of uh, anything, right? Like fruits, vegetables, people, objects. So it's kind of neat. There's a whole science behind it. And I mean, you should probably put some avocado in here. This avocado is, this. I actually got this for 90 cents at the farmer's market. Crazy smoking deal. Yeah, that's a good price. Yeah, yeah, it's insane. 
Wow. I really wish I was there with you in person right now. I could eat this sandwich. It looks unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I'll make some, I'll make you some of these when you come out and visit. Definitely go somewhere fun, go for a hike. Eat yeah. Sandwiches. That'd be so awesome. There's just so, something cool about eating raw vegan food in a beautiful, natural, pristine environment, especially some of the those teal blue turquoise lakes that we have around here. Oh, they're so nice. That avocado too, that looks like a perfectly ripe avocado. And what better yeah. than getting the stuff freshly picked from the garden? This is just unreal. No, it, yeah, it, it's come together perfectly. Perfect timing, you know, perfect time of year because it's harvest uh, season. So this avocado is not quite ripe but if you get one that's a little or it's ripe it's ripe enough to eat but if you get one that's a little bit more ripe you can make an avocado flour so i'm not going to put the avocado flour on in the sandwich but because i have the opportunity here i'm just going to see if i can pull off a quick rough avocado flour here just because it looks cool and why not this one won't turn out very well because you do want like a, a, it to be quite a bit softer. But while I'm here, I might as well make an avocado flour. So what you do is you do that and then you just pull it out like this. Yeah, those pieces are wrong. Well, it's be kind of a sketchy avocado flour. And then you just wrap it up kind of like that. That's turning out okay. But the riper the avocado, the nicer it is. So that's how avocado flowers are done. I don't know if you guys can see that. So that's kind of a rough, sketchy avocado flower. No, that is not a rough, sketchy avocado flower. That is a beautiful avocado flower. They're fun. I, I like them. They look good on salad. Of course, this is just going into, into the jackfruit sandwich. So. so I'll put, let's see, put a little layer of the greens down first. So I should probably cut another tomato just to make it, just to add some more color. this little guy notice how i'm not rinsing the tomatoes or any of the garden stuff really so i don't want to rinse the cyanonutrients which is uh, essentially vitamin b12 the cyanobacteria and because we sterilize everything and everything's grown with pesticides and grown in you know nutrient depleted soil we do lack you know, certain nutrients like vitamin B12. Most people in most diets lack B12. So sometimes if I can, if I'm harvesting things out of, out of the wild or out of the garden, I don't want to always uh, rinse that beneficial bacteria off of it. So this is an opportunity for me to, to keep that, that nutrient intact. So, I mean, I think that's basically what raw food's really about is um I'm just gonna move this food processor out of the way it's cramping my style yeah it's really about just keeping the, the nutrients intact and you know we all know it's better that way so i'll put a layer of avocado down on here it's so fun making these sandwiches too. You can get very artistic with your sandwiches. Sometimes I like to just color my bread just basically for aesthetics. It's, you know, there's a lot of, there's so many different food dyes that you can use. I like to use turmeric as a food coloring. Beetroot powder is a, a really good food coloring. And um, like I said, this E3 Live is probably one of my favorite. So let's go little bit of that yellow tomato. 
see, it's going to be hard to just eat fruit for the rest of the day after this <laughs> and not just smash this, uh, this sandwich right off the bat. But I'm going to wrap it up and put it in the fridge. And then I'm going to go running around town after this, go to TNT market and uh, scope out the durian. I'm going to be hitting durian. Now, what do we want to do? So we'll put the jackfruit on here. And I'll make it look as nice as possible for the thumbnail. Yeah, this is, <laughs> I know I've said it like five times. This looks so good. Yeah, if you can get a picture. After. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take a picture. It, we've got really good lighting today, so. It looks just so good. So I'm going to put lots of this pulled jackfruit on here just so it, just so it looks good. Even if it's hard to eat this thing, it's, it's going to taste good. I could probably get away with putting almost all of it on here. Yeah, and so I have a whole series of barbecue recipes that I've been kind of like developing over, like I said, the past 15 years, starting with my friend's barbecue parties. But um, so I've got this one. I've got this uh, barbecue brisket thing that I'm making. So I'm using this jackfruit, but I kind of blend it into a smoother paste. So that one's really good. I do a version of um, barbecue ribs, which are real. My ribs are really, really good. And my friend Johnny, the guy who uh, who got the cold smoker and got really into all the barbecue stuff he's he taught me how to make um steak rubs too which are really good and obviously it's kind of like you know something that vegans don't want to do is like rub a you know a dead animal down with uh with rubs but when i tasted johnny's spice uh his steak rub i was just like oh my god this is so good and he he gave me the recipe wrote down the ingredients so i still use that recipe as well so that's really really taste and uh, really tasty so that's how it's looking so far so maybe I'll go another layer of tomato on top of here sometimes I make the mistake of um, piling these things a little bit too high and then they make a big mess when I try and eat them for the most part you can just squish them down and they they hold together pretty good I guess it's like making any sandwich. If you pile it too high, it's um, can be messy. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we'll go a little bit more greens on top there. That should be good. Then we'll put the lid on it. That. So there she is. And it goes so good on the cornbread. There's just something about cornbread and barbecue sauce together. I think they kind of go hand in hand. But I mean, wow, I'm, I'm drooling that suit. That looks so good. I feel like it, I know it takes time, but I feel like that is worth the time. That just looks unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, when I'm actually just, getting home from work or back from the ski hill or the skate park. Honestly, these things come together a lot more quickly because I'm not trying to make it a hundred percent perfect every time. So I'm usually just like, bam, bam, bam. And then they're done. So it's not really that much work, but I good. mean, I just want to say like, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun with it. So it's, it's almost like it's not even worth. And when I'd say back 50, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, our grandparents, they used to 
you know, work really hard in the kitchen. And I'm, I remember as a child watching my grandma, just she'd be in there all day long. You know, she'd be making her sauerkraut, her pickles. She'd be in the garden all morning growing the stuff and planting it from seed. And I think we've kind of lost that as, yeah. as a culture. So I think it's really important to, to kind of have that back and get that back. Yeah. Well, you're um, bringing that back. I love it. Picking from the garden and just making everything with such care and patience and love. I feel like it's like good energy too that's put into that food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. So I well, don't know if we, we probably we don't have time, but I was almost going to sneak another recipe in here, but um, yeah. Yeah. What were you thinking? Well, I have the other cornbread. So I was maybe yeah. just going to smash together a quick like raw vegan peanut butter and jam sandwich. Yeah, but... that would be cool. I could do it like as a separate video, like I stop recording and then we do that one quick. Or is that it's... one going to be like the same stuff you used from this? It's basically the same stuff from this, but basically with peanut butter and jam on it or uh, yeah. coconut cream. We don't have to do that. Okay. We can do this one for now and do another one next time. Yeah, because this was a while. This is probably going to yeah. be an hour and 45 No, minutes. it's great. I, yeah, no, this was great though. Like I appreciate you coming on so much, sharing this. Like your recipes are just absolutely out of this world i recommend everybody go check out daniel's instagram page and see what i'm talking about you can see from this sandwich even but check out his feed it is so inspiring grab his book support him today because he puts so much into this and his work and his recipes are just truly incredible so i want to thank you so much for coming on i hope you enjoyed it thanks for sharing yeah it was a lot of fun and it was a pleasure to be on your show yeah and we'd love to have you back again so for sure let's do another recipe and the viewers, I hope you guys love this. If you did, give it a big thumbs up right now. Make sure you subscribe if you don't already. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye. Awesome.